you have your Bibles, would you please open them to the book of Galatians. We are going to be starting a new series in the book of Galatians. We're going to be starting this series, and the title is going to be called The Gospel of Freedom. And that's going to be hopefully evident in, uh, in a few minutes as we talk about the context of the book of Galatians. So as you're turning there, it's great to talk about what we call the context. What's going on in the book of Galatians? Uh, what, in, what is Paul writing about? Why is he writing things, these things? When is he writing these things? All of those are important. So let's talk a little bit about that as you are uh, turning there. The book of Galatians, well, we can start with the obvious, was written by Paul. Paul says in the very beginning, Paul, an apostle, this is the apostle Paul, and later on in, in, in the first chapter, he gives a bit of a bio, uh, biography, biographical sketch. So we, we know it's the apostle Paul, and he's writing to the Galatians. One thing, important thing to uh, think about here is that the Galatians, or the church of Galatia, as we should say, is not one church in one city. So he's not just writing to one church in one city. He's writing to a region where there's a number of churches. Galatia is a Roman kind of colony. It's a Roman province or territory. And it's north, of course, of Israel. And uh, the people of Galatia are largely Gentile people. Paul has gone through his first missionary journey up into the area of Galatians and, and around there. And he's established these churches. And they're largely Gentile churches in the area of Galatians. So there's a number of these churches. Um, and Galatians is a very uh, multicultural, or was at that point, kind of a multicultural area. There were, uh, you know, there were people in the north of Galatia, and they were kind of culturally cut off from the people in the south because it's kind of this mountain region. And so it, there's a lot of cultures going on in the area of Galatia. Again, it's not one church, it's not one city, it is a group of churches. And it's likely that Paul has in mind these southern cities, these southern churches that he's planted as he's writing to, um, to the people of Galatia. That doesn't exclude the people in the north. That just means that probably later, as these letters are meant to be passed around, they would have been passed around to other churches as well. But he's writing to the people of Galatians. Now, when it was written is actually quite important. It was probably written about 48 AD, although it could have been written up to a decade later than that. And to many people, that's just a number. But it actually is quite, quite important. Because often when we think of the early church, we think of nasty Roman persecution, right? You, you think of Emperor Nero, who's persecuting the Christians. And, and that's kind of our picture of the early church here. But, but that is not happening in the book of Galatians. It's important to recognize that. That doesn't start until about 64 AD, and we could, we could talk a little bit about the interesting circumstances under which that happened. You see, uh, Nero was the emperor, and there was a bunch of fires in Rome, and Nero was blamed for these fires, or he's accused of starting them, because he often talked about how he would have loved to level the city and build it up in his own image. And whether or not he started them, we don't know, but people started saying, we think he did it. And so Nero doesn't want to take the blame, he blames the Christians. The Christians started the fire, which starts a persecution of the Christians in Rome and then spreads later to the empire. But that's not until 64 AD. This is written, you know, late 40s. The Romans don't really care about the Christians at this point. In fact, the Romans, they just see the Christians as the Jewish religion a little bit differently. They all see the Jews and the Christians are all just in one ball for the Romans, and they don't really particularly care. They're not bothered by the Christians. And the Romans certainly don't mind the Jews because the Romans had this thing where they liked, they, don't, they didn't mind other religions to some extent. And especially if you were an older religion, they really didn't mind that. And so if they considered the Christians just to be part of the Jewish faith, they really didn't mind them. So we don't have Roman persecution of the Galatian church going on here, but we do have problems in the church. Now, a few minutes ago, I said that largely these are Gentile churches. And the idea that the Gentiles and the Jews are kind of all one faith to the Romans is kind of, kind of helps us to see what's going on here because um, the Gentiles in these churches uh, are being not persecuted yet, but they're being pressed because these people from outside the church who are Jewish leaders have come into the churches and they're preaching a gospel that says, whoa, 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 you can't just accept Jesus. You Gentiles need to become Jewish before you can accept Jesus. You can't just skip all of the Jewish uh, religion. You must become a Jew, and then you can become a Christian. 
And so that's largely the circumstance that Paul is writing to the people of Galatians. So Paul writes and he says, no. Christ makes somebody a Christian. The moment you add something to that, if you say you have to obey Moses' law, and the people, these, these Jewish leaders are coming into the church saying, you got to obey all of Moses' law, you got to be circumcised, and then you can become a Christian. But Paul says, no, if you do that, you are adding something to Christ's work, and it's a false gospel. It doesn't save you. In fact, it just leads you into slavery. Slavery of your sins, slavery of needing to think, thinking you have to obey all of God's law to please God. The real gospel is that Jesus alone saves. And in that gospel, the only true gospel, there is freedom. That's why we call it the gospel of freedom. Galatians, the gospel of freedom. So I hope you've had enough time to turn there. That's kind of a bit of a snapshot as to what's going on in the background, and we are going to read the first five verses of the book of Galatians now. I hope you're there, and uh, this is the word of the Lord. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches in Galatia, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, there are a, a few topics that we could talk about that would immediately divide our room. And uh, one of them, of course, would be politics, but I am certainly not brave enough to jump into that realm of things. Another topic that I think could easily divide our room that we've, we could talk about is the question of which do you prefer, Coca-Cola or Pepsi? Okay, okay. <laughs> well, I think we could probably solve this just simply with a show of hands. Who prefers Coca-Cola and who prefers Pepsi? All right, well... The majority picked Coca-Cola, but nonetheless, there are a few that did, you know, choose Pepsi. And I put my hand up for Pepsi. I actually prefer Pepsi. Now, I, I'm not a huge pop drinker, but if you offered me both of them and I needed to pick one, I would pick Pepsi. And there are some that are adamant. I will only drink one and I will not drink the other. Are you Are brave enough to say, who is adamant that they will only drink one and not the other? We got to, I mean, I... I I'm just showing what you should do, not, not that I put my hand up. There's a couple people who are absolutely adamant that they would drink one or not the other. Now, have you ever done a taste test? Yeah? I've done the taste test before. You take two glasses, you put them, Coca-Cola in one and Pepsi in the other, and you're blindfolded and you taste. Can you tell the difference? Some people claim they can. I wonder if we would do the test. In fact, the ushers are going to come out and give everybody a glass of... No. <clears throat> No, we're not going to do it, obviously, this morning, but I wonder, how confident are you that you could tell the difference? Not quite, eh? I, 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 did, I, I took that taste test. I mean, I, I did the taste test many years ago, and I was able to tell the difference, but I'm not so confident that I'd be able to do it again. Maybe it was just a fluke that I guessed the right one. And I would imagine even there's people here who are adamant. I prefer one over the other, and I will not drink the other. I wonder if they'd be able to tell us to tell, test, t taste the difference between them. Now that's a, you know, just a kind of a fun thing. But on a spiritual level, something similar is going on in the church of Galatians. See, there is the true gospel that's being held out to them, and there are false gospels that be, is being held out to them. And the question is, can the Galatians tell the difference? Yeah, they claim they believe in one, but as Paul's going to say in a bunch of verses, some of them can't taste the difference. On a spiritual level, can the Galatians taste the difference between Gospels? And we're not so different from the Galatians. I wonder, can you taste the difference between Gospels? And when I say Gospel, I mean that there is only one true Gospel and many false Gospels. Can you taste the difference? I pray you can. Because in one Gospel, there's freedom. But in a false Gospel is slavery to sin. Slavery 
that leads to damnation and hell. And so Paul is going to work that out in the book of Galatians. Can you taste a difference is what's going on here. And so in the first five verses of what Paul does, what we're going to look at today, first of all, he gives them the real deal. He says, here is the real gospel in the first five verses. And then as the weeks go on, we're going to see Paul is just going to destroy the, uh, the false gospels that are coming up as these false teachers are trying to convince them of. But first, Paul gives them the true gospel. And so the first five verses, this is the gospel. And I want us to understand from these first five verses that the true gospel comes from God, it is about God, and it glorifies God. The true gospel comes from God, it is about God, and it glorifies God. And we're going to see that. We're going to see that in these first five verses. Go back with me to verse one. We'll read the first couple of verses here. Paul begins... Paul, an apostle, not from man nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me to the churches in Galatia. Now, letters were not an uncommon thing back in the day. People sent letters to each other and it's not unusual to start a letter by saying, you know, Paul, you give your name and then you, you, uh, you give a greeting and then you go on with, your, the, with the whole body of your letter. So it starts off pretty normal. Paul gives his name, Paul, an apostle. But immediately, Paul interjects with a thought. You see, he could have said, Paul, an apostle, skip that middle bit and go right to verse 2. And all the brothers who are with me to the churches in Galatia. But he interjects with a thought. And he says, Paul, an apostle, not from man, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. Why? Why does Paul find it necessary to right off the bat defend his apostleship? That's what he's doing. He's saying, I'm not an apostle from man. I'm an apostle from God. Is it his pride? Well, inevitably, the false teachers were saying that Paul, he's not a true gospel. He's not a true apostle. I mean, he's not even one of the 12, right? He's not one of the 12. Jesus had his 12, and Paul wasn't told a little bit later. In fact, Paul was persecuting the church. Paul's not a real apostle. Now, if you can discredit Paul the apostle, you can discredit Paul's message. If Paul's not a true apostle, he's probably not preaching a true gospel. You see the attack on Paul here, and Paul defends himself not for pride because he wants to show you that, no, 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 no. No, I'm an apostle. I'm an apostle from God, and so my message is from God. Paul's gospel is Christ's gospel. Paul's gospel is Christ's gospel. So he says, Paul, an apostle, not from man nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. His calling is just like the other apostles, he claims, right? You remember in, in Mark chapter 3, Jesus, and in other gospels as well, Jesus calls his apostle, and he, he commissions them to preach, and he commissions them to, you know, uh, cast out demons and that kind of thing. He, he calls his apostles in the gospels. But Paul is not part of that, and that's true. But Paul, Paul's calling is no less um, authentic, you remember Paul's life, and we'll go through this in a couple of weeks when Paul gives his autobiographical sketch here, but you know Paul's life. He was a persecutor of the church, called himself Saul, right? Paul's got two names, Saul and Paul, but he persecuted the church. And on the road to Damascus, Christ appeared to him. Certainly that's what Paul's talking about here. No, 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 I'm an apostle through Christ because Christ appeared to me on the road is what Paul's thinking about here. Christ appeared to Paul, he blinded Paul, and then when Paul was finally, you know, healed of his blindness, Paul re or Jesus communicates to Paul, listen, you are going to be my apostle to the Gentiles and you are going to suffer for my name. That is a commissioning and a calling from Christ. So Paul here, he says, no, 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 I'm an apostle not from man, from God. From God, through Jesus Christ and God the Father. Now, he's not denying other gospel or other, other apostles. Paul is not saying, Peter's nothing, you should just listen to me. That's not what Paul is doing. Paul is not saying the other apostles are not important. Paul is simply saying, My message comes from God. I did not get a handbook from Peter. Not that Peter's handbook would be bad, but I did not get a handbook from Peter. This message is not from Peter. It is from God. Paul's gospel is Christ's gospel. Think of it this way. If, uh, let's say there was a photo circulating around of me lifting a heavy 
object, maybe a large rock. And you're all sharing this photo. Because nowadays you can share it on your phone, right? So you're sharing this photo on your phone of me lifting this giant rock. And you show your friend the photo and they say, wow, where'd you get that? Well, you might say, well, I got it from that person. I think they got it from that person. I think they got it from that person. It's going to be like, well, some, some person might be convinced, but some other person might say, I know Jason, he's not that strong. That's photoshopped. <laughs> okay? There's no way Jason can lift that rock. It's not very convincing, right? Now, if you say, I took the photo from my phone. I was there when Jason left, lifted that rock. That's more convincing. Paul is that's, it's, it's, that's what Paul is saying here. I got my message from Christ. Christ called me as an apostle, not man. Christ, Paul's gospel is Christ's gospel. And it's also confirmed by his travelers in verse 2. It's Paul, an apostle, and all the brothers who are with me. Like I said, Paul's not denying other apostles. In fact, there are many who are with Paul who are, who are writing with Paul, who affirm what Paul, who Paul is and what Paul is preaching. He's not denying other apostles. He's just saying, I got it from God. You cannot discredit my apostleship because I am from the Lord. The Lord commissioned me. In fact, here's another implication of this. Peter's gospel and Paul's gospel is the same gospel. So it's not that they're preaching different gospels. They're the same one. And this is great because go back to that picture that's being circulated around. Someone says, ah, I think it was photoshopped. Even if, it, even if it, you said, I took the photo myself, look. And someone says, that's photoshopped. Well, what if there were four or five different pictures going around of the same photo of me holding that rock just from different angles? Same photo, different angles. Really hard to fake that, right? That's what's going on here. Peter's gospel is the same as Paul's gospel, and both of them are Christ's gospel. The gospel comes from God. This should give us confidence. This should should give us confidence in God's word and the gospel that we can preach to our neighbors and our family and our friends because it is Christ's gospel. It It didn't start in somebody's imagination. In fact, just the end of verse 2, Paul writes to the churches in Galatia. It's easy to kind of be like, well, that's just part of the greeting. But listen, what gave Paul the confidence to write the letter in the first place? That it's a message from God. Why is he even writing this letter? Because he knows that this message saves people. What he's about to write saves people from hell and sends them to heaven in the presence of Jesus. This gospel that he's going to write to the Galatians is the only true gospel. And he can write with confidence to the Galatians. And we can preach that same gospel with that same confidence. So as you are sharing, Lord willing, with your family and friends the hope you have in Christ, take confidence in that good news. It's not coming from your brain. It's coming from the Lord. Share the true gospel with your family and friends because that gospel has power and you can have confidence in it because Paul's gospel is Peter's gospel is Christ's gospel. That's the origin. Right away, Paul establishes that the true gospel comes from God and he's going to establish that it's about God and that it glorifies God. Now, we skipped over a little phrase in verse 1. We didn't skip over it because it's not important. We're going to read it right now. So Paul says, Paul, an apostle, back in verse 1, not from men nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. Now, here's another question. If you're going to tell somebody about Jesus, usually you'd tell it chronologically, You'd say, well, Jesus, he was born at Christmas time. He was born to the Virgin Mary and uh, conceived by the Holy Spirit. And he, you know, he grew up. We have this little account when he's about 12 years old. But he grew up with sinless life. And he, he preached. He did miracles. He did these great things. And then he died on the cross. And then he was raised to life again. And he ascended to heaven at the right hand of the Father. The resurrection kind of comes near the end. But Paul, Paul puts it right here, right at the start. Who raised him from the dead? Why? I think we see this because Christ's resurrection is the central theme of the gospel. Christ's resurrection is the central theme of the gospel. Yes, Jesus did a lot of teaching. He was a great teacher. He taught us about God. Yes, he taught about he taught God's law. Yes, Jesus did a lot of miracles. He healed people. He stopped a storm with his voice. That's pretty amazing. He raised people from the dead. Yes, Jesus was a, a moral person. He was perfect. But none of that matters 
if Jesus is not raised from the dead. The central theme of the gospel is Christ's resurrection. Christ's resurrection is that, is that pillar of the gospel. Paul kind of, um, he goes further in 1 Corinthians 15 about this. He says, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, well, your preaching and your faith are useless. That's absolutely true. If God is not able to beat death, then what's the point of preaching about that God? If God is not able to beat death, if death can beat God, then, then what's the point of, of believing in that God? It's useless. Not only that, but we portray God as a liar because God promised it was going to happen. Jesus himself said, listen, you destroyed this temple, meaning his body, and I'm going to raise it up again in three days. If that did not happen, then God is a liar. What's the point of Christianity if God is a liar? It's useless. Preaching is useless. Your faith is useless. You portray God as a liar if Jesus has not been raised from the dead. And you're still in your sins. We preach you can be forgiven in Jesus. If Jesus has not been raised from the dead, you're not free of your sins. Because sin and death are connected. How do we know there's still sin in the world? Because there's still death in the world. How would you know if sin is taken away? If death is taken away. But if they're still there, if death is still around, if death has not been conquered, sin has not been conquered, you're still in your sins. If Jesus has not been raised from the dead, you're still in your sins. And on top of that, those who've fallen asleep in Christ, they have no hope. All the Christians that have they fallen asleep here, we mean die, right? All the Christians who have died in the past, all the saints of the Old Testament who believed in the promises of God, they have no hope. It's the end for them if Christ has not been raised from the dead. You see how the resurrection is the central theme of the gospel? It is a pillar upon which the gospel of God, the gospel of Christ, stands. Think about it this way. Let's say we're stranded on an island. Let's say we're in a plane and we get, you know, we crash and we're on this island. And uh, there's no hope of rescue. We're in big trouble because we're just stranded on this island and we're freaking out, right? (laughs) I would be. But then I turn and you say to you, listen, okay, listen, listen. Don't worry. I've trained for this my entire life. I am a survival expert. I know there's animals on this island that I can hunt. I know that there's all kinds of edible plants on this island that I can harvest. We can eat. I know how to collect rainwater. We're going to be able to drink. I can make a fire. No problem at all. I can make us a shelter. I can make weapons. I know how to do this. Don't worry. And on top of that, I can make a boat. I can make a boat that will take us to safety. How's that going to make you feel? Pretty good, right? Now, what if I was just saying that to make you feel better and I have no idea what I'm doing? What good is that? What good is it if it's not true? No, no, we're in big trouble. Listen, the message of the gospel apart from the resurrection is useless. It's just, it doesn't do anybody any good. The gospel is not there to just make you feel better about yourself so that you can live your best life now. That's not the point of the gospel. The point of the gospel is to give life, life everlasting. Indeed, Christ has been raised from the dead. If he had not, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, we should be pitied above all people. If Christ had not been raised from the dead, we are wasting our time. But Christ has been raised from the dead. He has been bodily raised from the dead. It's not just an illusion. It's not just a, it's a spiritual. No, no, no. This is a bodily resurrection that, Jesus, that happened. Jesus was bodily raised from the dead. And if he's raised from the dead, then preaching of his gospel is power. People can and will be saved as the gospel is preached. Your faith, your faith is sure if Jesus has been raised from the dead. And he has. You can have faith in this God. The gospel is powerful. Your faith is powerful. And God is not a liar. God is a truth-telling, a faithful, promise-keeping God since Jesus has been raised from the dead. Because God promised it and he made it happen. And that, my friend, is a very solid place to put your faith in a God who is faithful and a God who tells the truth and a God who makes all things happen the way he wants them to happen, as we're going to see in a few moments. So preaching is powerful. Your faith is, in a good, is, in, is on a solid rock. God is not a liar because he is, he's, a, he's a promise-keeping God. On top of that, you have been freed from your sins. If you trust in Jesus, as we're going to see in a moment, as he dies on the cross to take your sins away, 
your sins are gone. And the evidence of that is the resurrection. Because like I said before, death, sin are connected. If Jesus' claim is that he beat sin, he also needs to show that he beat death. And if he has shown to us he has beaten death, then what else has he shown us? He has beaten sin. You are not still a slave to your sins if you are a Christian. If you trust Jesus, you are free from your sins that separate you from God. And the evidence of that is Jesus' resurrection. The resurrection is a central theme of the gospel. And not only that, but look, death is not the end. Death is not the end. All the people who've, who've died in Christ, believing in Christ, trusting in the promises of God, they too have the hope of a bodily resurrection to be with Christ forever and ever. Paul calls Jesus the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep, which means if it's the first fruits, there's more to come. All those who believe in Jesus will be bodily raised from the dead like he was, and we will be with him forever and ever in eternity. Yeah, Christ's resurrection is the central theme of the gospel. Now listen, like I said before, the gospel is not there just to make you feel better about yourself. If you're here this morning chasing after something else, what are you chasing after? Money, fame, power, more time on this earth? What is that? What is that? What does it benefit you to gain all of that and to forfeit your soul? Nothing. You lose it all. How much better to forfeit what the world has to offer and gain Christ? Because all that you can gain from the world is totally useless if you don't have eternal life. And so it's much, much better. And I would plead with you now, if you have not done this, forfeit whatever the world has to offer you. For, stop those attempts of going after, again, money or fame or power or whatever, luxury, whatever it is. Stop those attempts and believe in Christ. Follow him because you will lose those things, but you will gain eternal life. That is the good news of Jesus. That is the good news of Jesus. The true gospel comes from God. It is about God, and it glorifies God. Give up the world to gain Christ. We move on to the next couple of verses. And we show, see this in verse 3 and 4, that Christ has secured for us peace and grace from God. Christ has secured for us peace and grace from God. Verse 3 says this, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age. Now, it's not, like I said, it's not unusual for these letters, as you're going to write a letter to somebody in the ancient world to say, you know, Paul, an apostle, uh, and the, those with me to the church in Galatia, and just, be, and just offer this kind of like, and peace to you. It's a, it's a nice greeting. If I was going to send an email to you, I might be like, hey, how's it going? This is Jason writing. Hope your family's doing well. And then I would get on to the real content of the email, right? But Paul here, it's not just a throwaway line when he says, grace to you and peace from God. It's not just a, ah, you know, it's polite to add this. He means grace and peace are yours in God. He means that. He takes this greeting that everyone would have used and he used it for his advantage to say, I actually mean it. You have grace and peace in God. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Christ has really secured for us peace and grace from God. Now, the gospel gives these things, which the implication is, is that without the good news of Jesus, we don't have peace, do we? We don't. We're going to talk about acquiring the goodness of, or the salvation of the gospel in grace in a second, but let's talk about peace for a second. It means that our default is that we don't have peace. Why? We don't have peace with God by default because of our sin. It's because all of us have rebelled against God on one level or another, have failed to obey his law, have willingly disobeyed his law, and so we have sin that separates us from God, and it does not bring peace. We have hostility, actually. We are, we call, we, we are enemies of God by default. In fact, one of the uh, 
one of, one of the joyful things about, you know, being a pastor, and, and actually my wife, you know, serves with me, with me in this, is that we do, we can do some premarital counseling. We've done a couple of those sessions. And so it's, it's a joy to walk with couples as they're getting ready to, uh, to take the plunge, as it were, to get married, right? And uh, we walk through a bunch of things. But one thing that I, that I like to really uh, focus on for, you know, for some time is the idea of, of developing habits of forgiveness, which is to say this, listen, when you sin against your spouse, your future spouse, right? Make it a habit to as fast as you can stop and ask for forgiveness. And on the other side, when you've been sinned against and, so, and your spouse says, I'm sorry, will you, forgive you, will you forgive me? Make it a habit to as fast as you can say, yes, I forgive you. Why? Well, because it models Christ, but it also brings peace. That's peace in the marriage. Can you imagine the other way around? No one ever asks for forgiveness, right? I sin, but I'm never asking for forgiveness. And when someone does ask me forgiveness, I say no. What does that do? Well, you know this. You know this. Has sin ever brought you closer in relationship with somebody? No. Sin breaks peace. If there is no genuine repentance, if there's no genuine forgiveness, there's no peace. There's just hostility. And what we know by experience is true about our relationship with God. Our sin breaks that peace. We have no peace with God. But Jesus deals with our sin. And look at, ver look at, verse, look at verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. We get peace from God because Jesus gave himself for our sins. First of all, the first thing to note here is that Jesus was not dragged to the cross for our sins. He gave himself for our sins. He willingly went to the cross to take our sins from us. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross so that we may have peace with God. So as Jesus is on the cross, remember Jesus did nothing wrong his whole life. Nothing, never sinned. He, as he's hanging on the cross, he takes our sin upon him. See, the Bible is clear. The wages of sin is death. If we sin, we should die and be separated from God for all of eternity. Physical and spiritual death. Jesus is the only one who never deserved to die, and yet he's hanging on the cross. Why? Because our sins are being put on to Jesus. If you believe that this morning, then your sins are put on to Jesus. If you trust Jesus to take your sins away, then they are away. They're on Jesus and you, you have them no more because Jesus took your sins. He took the wrath of God, the punishment of God that you and I deserve for our sins. Jesus took it upon himself as he was on the cross and our sins are gone. If you believe in Jesus, that's the true gospel. And now what do we gain? You do have peace with God because your sins are no more. You have peace with God because the punishment for your sins has been paid in full by Christ. Jesus, who gave himself for our sins. And how do we obtain this? We obtain it by grace. You can't pay God off. Not with money, clearly, but not with good deeds. That's a harder one for us to grasp. You cannot pay God off with your good deeds. You cannot be a good enough person to impress God that he'll let you into heaven. I cannot be any clearer than this. You cannot be good enough in and of yourself to get to heaven. That is not the case. You must receive salvation, peace with God, the forgiveness of your sins as a gift from God by grace. Come to Jesus by faith, believing that he died on the cross for your sins, to take them all away, and you receive the gift of grace, the gift of forgiveness and peace with God. That's the true gospel. The true gospel comes from God. It's about God, and it glorifies God. And it gets even better. If you didn't think it could get better, it does get better. Because look at verse 4 again. So Jesus, who gave himself for our sins, and the effect is this, to deliver us from the present evil age. The purpose is to deliver us from this evil age. Now, what does this evil age mean? I think it means a couple things. First of all, 
the evil within ourselves and the evil without ourselves. All the things that, that aim to harm us and hurt us and the result of our broken world, that's what we are delivered from. We have hope beyond this world. And no doubt, this is also, Paul has in mind, a picture of the new heavens and the new earth. Because not only do we have sin within, not only are there sinful people who are pushing on us as Christians, but we live in a broken world where the whole world is broken because of sin. There's sickness. There's natural disasters. There's wars. There's all kinds of things. And one day, it'll be gone. And God will create a new heaven and a new earth without, of all, without all of that. And we will be delivered. We will be free from this present evil age. This is the gospel of freedom. This is the gospel of freedom. We are freed from this. I can't help but think, of course, the, the Israelites as they're freed from Egypt, right? They're, you know the story. The Israelites are in Egypt and they're slaves, right? Pharaoh has enslaved the Israelites. And he's, you know, causing, or getting to build all a bunch of other stuff, a bunch of stuff. But here comes Moses sent by God and, and God uses Moses to, to free the Israelites from Egypt. There's plagues and there's the plague of the firstborn that causes Pharaoh to say, okay, fine, get out finally. So they leave, they come to the edge of the sea. God opens up the waters. The Israelites go through and they are freed from the slavery of Egypt. We can't help but picture that here. But that's not the end of the story, is it? When they get to the end of the water, it's not just, I guess we're done. Freedom. It's freedom from slavery, but it's freedom to something else. The Israelites are freed from slavery and given the hope of the promised land, aren't they? God says, now, now we're going to begin our journey to the promised land. He, he, he first leads them to Mount Sinai where he gives them, God, God gives them his good life-giving law. It is a good law that they should follow. It gives them life. And he says, okay, now we're on the way to the promised land. See, he's freeing them from slavery and he's freeing them to the promises of God. And it's the same thing for us. We are freed from this evil age, freed from the sin within, freed from the sin without, but we're freed to righteousness. We've got God's good commands. We have the hope of the better promised land, as the, as the writer of the Hebrews writes. There is a better promised land that is still to come, and that's the new heavens and the new earth. What glorious, glorious hope this is that we've been freed from the slavery of sin, but we've been freed to righteousness and to the promise of the new heavens and the new earth, where we will be with God forever and ever. Yeah, Christ has secured for us peace and grace from God. Now, I said earlier, I keep saying the true gospel comes from God, and it's about God and glorifies God. The true gospel is truly about God. Now, we benefit, but it's about God. Think of, it, think of Egypt. Who's the hero of that story? It ain't Moses, and it ain't the Israelites. The hero of that story is God himself. And look at us. Where are we in this equation that Paul, is, this, that Paul has uh, shown us in the first five verses of Galatians? Where are we? We're the recipients. We benefit from it. But who's doing the work? It is God. It's like if I, uh, it's like if I I'd love to do this, but I obviously can't. If I gave you a gold bar as a, uh, as a present one day, I said, here you go. It's worth a million dollars. Clunk, here's a gold bar. Whoa. Okay, that's a pretty amazing gift. You take your gold bar and you're like, whoa, well, Hey, and you go to your, the nearest friend, look what I got. I, I got given a gold bar. What's the first thing that's going to come out of your friend's mouth? Who gave it to you? Right? Who, where'd you get it? Who gave you that thing? Why? It's not because, I mean, you benefit from the gold bar, but the point is, look at, if the giver can give you, if this is the, 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 if this is the value of the gift, what must the giver be like? Indeed, we benefit from the gospel for sure, but the gift of the gospel is so glorious, it reflects the glorious giver of the gospel. The gospel really is all about God. Again, we definitely benefit, but God, it gets all the glory. It is all about God who saves his people. The, these people who are going to come to the Galatian churches are going to preach a different gospel that no, 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 it's about you too. You, 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 you're, you're, you're part of this in some level, on some level, and Paul says, no, 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 no. The gospel comes from God. The true gospel comes from God. It is about God. And as we're going to see next, and we're going to close with this, it glorifies God. God is the hero. 
Look at verse 4 and 5 again with me. Who gave himself for our sins, that's Jesus, to deliver us from the present age, and here we go, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. God's sovereign will, which means he controls all things. God's sovereign will glorifies him in all things. God's sovereign will glorifies him in all things. It all happens according to the will of God. Look at verse 5 again. But verse 4, according to the will of God our Father. Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection is not a mistake. It is not a mistake. And it's not just a second thought by God, right? It's not that God woke up one day, because God never sleeps, but it's not that God woke up one day and thought, uh, I, I have an idea. I'll send Jesus my son. That is not how it happened. Christ's death and res- well, all of it has been planned since the beginning of time, since before the beginning of time, from eternity past, God has planned for the work of Christ. All of it is according to God's will, and all things happen for his glory. Now listen to this. Not only was Christ's work planned from before eternity, but your salvation has been planned since before eternity. The fact that God would choose you if you believe in Jesus, that has been planned since before eternity passed. Paul writes to the Ephesians, you've been predestined. You've been predestined. God chose you to be in Christ. Predestined before the foundations of the earth. Before you were even in existence, God had planned that you would be saved. That is certainly, certainly the the truth of God's work here, of God's word. Now listen, let that sink in. God chose you to be saved from eternity past. There might be someone sitting beside you who's not saved. You maybe have people in your family that are not saved, friends that are not saved. Why does God choose you over them? Now, Lord willing, they might be saved one day too, but the reality is God chooses some and not others. Let that sink in that God chose you for eternity with him if you believe in Christ. If that does not well up in you, thankfulness, and wanting to give God glory for all things, then you need to think deeper about your salvation. That God chose you to be saved should well up in you the deepest thankfulness that God has ordained you for eternity to be with him. For his glory. Yes, God does all things for his glory. He's planned all things for his glory, including your salvation and my salvation. In fact, God does all things to glorify himself. God glorifies himself in every single thing that he does. Now, at first, when you first think about that, if you're like me, you're thinking, it's kind of prideful to say that I do all things for me. Now, if I were to say that, that would be very prideful. That would be very, very prideful. I do all things for my glory. That's clearly a prideful statement because I said it. Because, because I'm not the most glorious being. But it's not prideful when God says it because it's true. God is the most glorious being. Think about it this. If God were to give glory or do something for the glory of another, isn't that just idolatry? That's just idolatry. God cannot do that because God can't sin and that's idolatry. God must do all things for his glory because he is the most glorious being. For us to say that, it's pride. For God to say that, it's absolutely true. Think of this. If let's, let's say there's a new restaurant that opened up in town. And I went there and I came back and gave you a glowing review. And I said, you've got to eat at this restaurant. I mean, it is amazing. Everything they ordered was just, your taste buds will dance on your tongue. It, it, guaranteed, you'd never tasted food like this before. You need to go to this restaurant. Okay, so you go to the restaurant and you eat there. And you're like, yeah. You try it and you're like, everything he said was true and more. In fact, half of what he said was not even true. This is way better than he, than he explained it to me. Is the praise and glory of the restaurant worth it? Yeah, because it's true. Now suppose you went and they reheated you some day-old mac and cheese in the microwave and put that before you. Now is my praise of the restaurant worth it? Is it true? No, it doesn't deserve the praise and the glory because it's simply not true. But God is the most glorious being and he does deserve the glory. And because it is true, God does all things for his glory. That's why, and, and, and also we, we, 
We benefit from this. When something beautiful is praised and, and, and is praised and, and lifted up, we benefit from it. Right? As God is glorified, as God is praised by his people, we benefit. And not just us, but the world benefits. As we glorify God, those around us will see the glory of God and desire him. And God will call people to his true gospel. That's why I say all the time, for God's glory and for our joy. They are hand in hand. God's glory and our joy go hand in hand. It is our highest joy to glorify God. It truly is. So I'll ask again, can you taste the difference? The gospel is from God. It is about God and it glorifies God. The gospel is a message from God. It is, it is centered around the resurrection of Jesus, that Jesus secured for us on the cross peace with God as he took our sins away on the cross. And we receive this by grace. It's a gift from God that we receive as we believe in Jesus. And we are freed from the evil of this age and given the hope of resurrection life in the new heavens and the new earth. And now the Christian's life is to glorify God. That's the gospel. Can you taste the difference? I pray that you can. Because next week, Paul's going to show us that the other gospels, they just lead to slavery. The true gospel comes from God. It's about God. And it glorifies God. Let's pray. God, I thank you for these, these opening five verses in Galatians. God, that really just lay out for us the good news of Jesus, what we call the gospel. God, I know often I will just say gospel and assume that, that people know what it means, God, but thank you for this clarification today that this is the gospel. This is the good news. This is what we mean when we talk about Jesus. And God, I pray that you would grow our um, confidence in the gospel because it comes from you and it's backed by your power and it does save people. So thank you for that. And God, I pray that we are a church that knows the difference. I pray that we have church that people are sitting in the pews who know the difference between the true gospel and false ones, that we may glorify you and hold out the true gospel to a world that needs it. And of course, God, we pray these things for your glory and for our joy in Jesus Christ. Amen. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to the need, O Lamb of God. Just that.